This is Red Eyes Creations Radio. My name is Henrik Palmgren, coming to you from the west coast of Sweden. Thank you for tuning in to our internet radio broadcast. RedEyesCreations.com is the website, and today we have an interesting program ahead of us. We are going to talk about the electric universe and plasma mythology with our guest Rens van der Sluis. He is the author of two books. The Mythology of the World Axis, Exploring the Role of Plasma in Mythology, in World Mythology, and also The World Axis as an Atmospheric Phenomenon. He is also behind the website Mythopedia.info, and he regularly contributes articles to Thunderbolts.info that focus on the electric universe theory. And uh, Ren's research looks at uh, what I myself consider to be one of the most interesting aspects to the electric universe theory, and uh, that is the so-called plasma mythology idea. And uh, as I said, that is what we're going to explore here today. Uh, the website is mythopedia.info. It's the main site you need to take a look at for much more of what we'll be discussing here today. So uh, let's say welcome to our guest. Uh, hi, Ren's. Thank you for coming on Red Eyes Creations Radio. Thanks for having me on the show, too. It's great. Much appreciated. Thank you. To kind of set the context here for our program today, I'm going to uh, read a, a paragraph, I thought, from, from uh, that is taken from your Mythopedia website to get into the uh, mindset, so to speak, of the program. Excellent. From the second half of the 20th century, cosmologists and geophysicists have made great advances in modeling the electromagnetic environment of the Earth in response to the solar wind and the other external features impinging on the Earth, such as near-Earth objects. Our purpose is to consider how knowledge of this kind might aid our understanding of traditional ideas about cosmology and the recent history of the Earth, as documented in the history of astronomy, archaeoastronomy and certain classes of mythology and ancient ritual. Auroral phenomena and zodiacal light and various transient atmospheric events have been recorded throughout history. In particular, recent studies indicate that the Earth experienced a high-energy auroral storm uh, towards the end of the Neolithic Age, which human cultures have recorded in the form of petroglyphs, geoglyphs and a class of rituals and myths conveniently described as creation myths. The spectacular lively shapes caused by the instabilities in the plasma were uh, remembered by the ancients as gods, ancestors or dragons, whose mysterious deeds in the celestial world constituted the destruction and creation of the world. So uh, fascinating indeed, Renz, you know, before we dive into this very interesting topic. I'd, I'd actually like to know a little bit about your background when it comes to the electric universe and, uh, and of course, how this connects with mythology. As, as I understand it, you have a master's degree in comparative and historical lingui- linguistics. Um, and spe- That's right, yeah, I'm actually a linguist. Exactly, and specializing specializing in the Indo-European and Semitic language families. So, I mean, in your studies in regards to language then, uh, did this in any way kind of spark your interest in, in mythology and, and even perhaps in the electric uh, universe theory? No, actually not in the least, uh, to be honest. Um, it didn't spark my interest. Um, but I do believe that linguistics is actually one of the best uh, possible preparations for a study of mythology. And that's for two reasons. Um, for one thing, uh, most mythologists, people like Joseph Campbell, Mircea Elliot, the big, the big ones, were not really able to uh, read any of the sources they used in the original languages. So they couldn't really read Latin or Greek, and there was no analysis of Egyptian or Sumerian. Yeah. If you can do that, and you can you can check primary sources, it's just such a big advantage. So and y- the second thing is that the linguistics, um, especially uh, the, the historical branch, um, offers a structural method that really helps in investigating myth. Ah. Obviously, myth- mythology as such isn't really an existing scholarly discipline um, with, with a basis of agreement among specialists. Hmm. There, there, um, there's lots of um, myth, myths um, are known, but the analysis, there's no single single um, accepted theory, basically. That's right. Um, so so your I, I do believe in the, ne- in the Netherlands, for instance, it isn't even possible to study mythology as a subject. Really? 
on just because it's 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 part of the history of literature, the history of ideas. Ah. Um, it doesn't really fit anywhere comfortably, and there's no consensus theory of myth as such. Hmm. Interesting. So I mean, you're uh, since you're special, specializing in in Semitic language families and things like this, can can you read like uh, ancient Sumerian or Akkadian or what what are the language groups? Sumerian, Akkadian, um, and a bunch of other Semitic languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, huh. um, bits of Egyptian, also the classical languages, Sanskrit, Hittite, and basically um, the, the uh, essences of most in the European languages. So there's bits of Old Irish, um, Scandinavian languages, and all sorts. And a bit of Korean as well recently. Oh, fascinating. And uh, I guess these are kind of very good in regards to the mythology because mo- ma- most of the mythologies come you know, f- out, out from this era to begin with. Isn't that right? Absolutely, yeah. No, I, f- I found the, um, the knowledge of languages as a toolkit most helpful in the investigation of myth. Definitely. But also the, the structural way of thinking, the structural methods that linguistics supplies has been really invaluable in the study of myth as well. Hmm. Um, basically, mythology, as it came to me, was just an enormous welter of unorganized data, thousands and thousands of myths, and no real method of structuring them. And um, linguistic um, models of classifying grammatical data actually helped me to devise a new method of looking at myths and sorting them and um, classifying them into categories and stuff. Mm, I see. So it's been it's been a major advantage this this linguistic background. Mm, fascinating. How how um, you know can can you remember what kind of sparked your interest going into the area of mythology to begin with? That started at a really early age. Uh, I remember as a child already, I was um, inspired um, and also felt a challenge to see if myths from one particular culture could be matched to those of another especially Greek mythology, um, showed a number of similarities to Scandinavian myth, um, Germanic mythology, Iceland, the Eddas. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just really inspired to see if I could weave the two together into a unified narrative that would explain the two sets of them. Mm -hmm. And it didn't work. Um, But I kept being intrigued by that throughout the years. And it wasn't until I was about 20 in my uh, student time that I discovered that um, there are definitely some keys, some really fascinating keys that help you um, bring myths together and and find a unifying key, as it were. Mm, Fascinating. Uh, And I guess also that this, um, when when we tie in or when you tie in um, plasma mythology or, or even the electric universe theories, that's maybe perhaps when you can begin to bridge the different mythologies. Would you say that that's a correct assessment to make? Yeah, I think that's absolutely fundamental. I I would say um, the biggest common denominator in the new mythology is the influence of electromagnetic phenomena on human lives Mm. in all its manifestations. That basically you could define as what I have called plasma mythology. It's a term people have used before me. Um, so that ranges from a lightning, uh, experiences with lightning, to auroral effects and mythology about fire. Basically everything that binds, or everything that's defined by electromagnetism is brought together under this um, name. Hmm. And that, that's a fundamentally new direction in mythology. You said that there were some other people that have defined this term previously. Uh, maybe you can, uh, are, are there some n- known names, so to speak, there? I don't, I, I'm not sure anything of this has appeared in printed publications so far. And the people I refer to, they are in the same um, group of scholars I'm working with closely. Um, Wallace Thornhill in particular, uh, the Australian electrical engineer who has been active in the electric universe theory, right. I believe was the first to... Um, throw it into the public, the, the term plasma mythology. Mm, interesting. And I found it, um, for the moment being, the most comfortable term to use. Although it is a bit confusing, because we're not really talking about plasma television screens, obviously. <laughs> we're also not talking about the plasma in blood. Right. So it isn't immediately clear to the major- to a majority of people what, what plasma mythology would be about. Uh, and I am, mm? I am on the lookout for perhaps a clearer term um, for future use. 
maybe you could help us and, and define uh, plasma a little bit then. What, what is the you know basics of it? How, how does it work? And, and can we see it somewhere today, so to speak? Basically, plasma, I think the briefest definition would be to say that it's an ionized gas. Plasma is the fourth state of matter on top of solids and liquids and gases. And it's, in theory, it's what you get if you keep heating up a gas. Hmm. What happens then is that the, um, the atoms become disintegrated. The electrons get loose within the gas. And as a result, you have an electric current and electromagnetic phenomena begin to develop within the gas. That's what a plasma essentially is. Um, it's, said, it's claimed by plasma physicists that 99.999 um, something percent of the entire universe consists of plasma. That's a lot. So that includes all stars. Mm. And that includes practically everything upward from the ionosphere of the Earth and the atmosphere of the Earth. On the surface of the Earth, which we inhabit, there isn't really much plasma activity, but fire and lightning are perhaps the most uh, familiar phenomena to us. Right, right. Um, you know, you mentioned... Uh Wallace uh, Thornhill and uh, the guys over at Thunderbolts.info. How, how long have you been uh, kind of working and contributing articles to, to them? I think our cooperation really goes back to um, 2000. But um, the Thunderbolts website where did these picture of the day uh, appear, I think, has only been in the air since 2005 or so. Mm -hmm. hmm. Most real progress was made in um, the past four or five years. All right, I see. That also uh, includes the work on the uh, the world axis. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, the two monographs are about that you just mentioned. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, let's definitely dive into to that here a little bit later. You know, on your website also you have <clears throat> a very good question, I think, uh, and and I guess the answer <laughs> to that is obvious uh, to begin with. But let me read the question here: Could the prehistoric sky have been much more active than now? Uh, and again, the obvious question to that would be yes. But uh, do you, at any, you know, at this point, have any ideas as to uh, why the sky or the heavens or or the space, as, as it were, around the Earth uh, was more active in the past? Yeah. Before I uh, answer that question, I should like to point out that this question was the prehistoric sky, prehistoric sky, more active than now, was also raised by astronomers who have basically nothing to do with our electromagnetic acts. Um, comatologists, in particular, in, in most recent years, have uh, repeatedly um, posed the same question, just by looking at the, uh, the catastrophic effects of comets, uh, meteor showers, meteorite falls, mm -hmm. in the inner solar system. They've basically drawn the same conclusion, and an increased zodiac light, that um, we aren't really inhabiting a very safe, stable, and uh, eventless uh, corner of the universe. Hmm. So we're sharing this with uh, a number of other scientists at the forefront of science, I would say. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing I'd like to, to emphasize. Definitely. Um, and, you know, again, do, do you have any ideas to what events in the past, um, you know, that caused the, the sky at that point to be more active? Why, why was it more, um, you know, e uh, plasma basically caused back then than, than there is today? Or is this the case? Okay, okay, this is obviously the million dollar question. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have the answer as yet. I don't think I will ever have um, for the simple reason that I am not a scientist myself. So ultimately the answer will, the answer will come from scientists, mm. not from mythologists. But obviously I do have an opinion and um, I do believe that the likeliest scenario at this point is um, increased solar activity. Uh, why am I saying that? Basically, the northern and southern lights, the auroras that you see most strongly at the poles, mm -hmm. are directly influenced by solar weather through the so-called solar wind, which carries charged particles from the atmosphere of the sun close to our planet. 